Sure, I feel like I'm on some sort of panel here with all these microphones. <laughs> Good evening to everybody. On behalf of Professor Mutwa, it is my pleasure and privilege to be able to welcome you here this evening. I've got a couple of people I want to welcome, firstly in general, and then specifically some people that Harit has asked that we welcome. So we have two of our Deputy Vice-Chancellors with us this evening, Research, Internationalization and Innovation, and our DVC for People and Ops. Our Registrar is with us this evening, Executive Deans and their representatives of faculties. In particular, as this is for the Faculty of Engineering, the Bolt Environment and Technology, I'd like to welcome Prof. Marshall Sheldon, who's the new Executive Dean of the Faculty. Had to get that one in, Marshall. Um, and then also our Deputy Dean, Prof. Delenka Potis, who's next to me over here. Amongst us, we have academic colleagues, so particularly to the professors and the other academic colleagues, students that are here, and friends and colleagues, particularly those who are joining us online. Now, Prof. Crawford has particularly asked me to, to welcome some of the honored guests and family members. So in this regard, firstly, his wife, Katerina, who I've seen here this evening. Nice to have you with us. His son, Patrick. I guess Patrick's at home. Yes, he's what? He's six years old? Right, yeah, it wouldn't have maybe been the best, most exciting event for him, but Wonderful. I know that Patrick is very close to your heart. And then his mother, Annette Crawford, is with us. And we also acknowledge his late father, Dirk. And Harriet has indicated that he is so grateful for the way that his parents have shaped his life. So thank you very much for the wonderful job you've done. He's also got his one sister, Yad Annette. There's Danette at the back there, and then Suzette is online. And the other members of the Crawford family that are online, we also just say welcome to you, as well as friends. And then some of his supervisors are either here or online. And I'll single out Prof. John Smallwood, Mr. Johan Berger, and Prof. Liesel Frick, colleagues of the Department of Quantity Surveying. And I might also say, past colleagues of the Department of Quantity Surveying. We have all the HODs represented. There's a row at the back there um, from past and present. So welcome to all of you. Lovely to have you with us this evening. Um, and then there are particular line managers that Harrod has worked with that he just wanted to welcome, especially in terms of Profani Base. Roy Cumberledge, Delenka Potis, um, Dr. Sue Petratus, and Prof. Ben van Weyck, our previous um, Executive Dean of the Faculty, and then honors and doctoral students and master students, past and present. Prof. Crawford is really grateful to all of you for journeying with him and supporting and encouraging him on the road to this major career milestone. Certainly one of those evenings you're going to remember, Harriet. We know that the support of family and friends and colleagues is at the core of our success as individuals. Prof. Cuffert, it has been a pleasure for me to interact with you over the years. I got to know you as someone who is equally passionate about teaching and learning and research. You are one of our own products in that you studied a number of your qualifications with us up to the PhD level. And then having spent some time working in Ireland, you started lecturing in the Department of Quantity Surveying in 2008. This always makes it even more pleasing that you have risen through the ranks here to the most prestigious, highest academic post level of professor. Now when it comes to the functions or missions, as some people say, of higher education. We always used to say that there were three missions, but 
The experiences during the pandemic and the changing world of work have led to an expansion. It is now perceived that universities have five missions, teaching and learning, research and scholarship, impactful social engagements, innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainable and progressive change, and the duty of care. These are intertwined and academics are always encouraged to work across them. Prof Crawford, as I browse through your CV and based on my engagements with you, you are a good example of an academic who advances your discipline and its application in industry, which is kind of what we would call engagement, um, and that you ask questions about how to advance the facilitation of student learning and success, and then seek out answers both in the literature and through researching some of these questions, as we will hear, in fact, in your inaugural lecture this evening. Now, inaugural lectures provide Mandela Uni the opportunity to acknowledge your achievements and promotion to a full professor, to introduce you to the academic community and the broader publics, many of whom are online this evening, and to give you the opportunity to profess some of your knowledge and insights that you have gained through your scholarly work. So, let me congrat congratulate you, Professor, on your outstanding achievement. Being promoted to the level of a full professor is the ultimate recognition of your remarkable accomplishments as an academic and engaged scholar in your academic discipline and in teaching and as an academic citizen. We look forward to listening to your lecture tonight. We also look forward to supporting you in your ongoing scholarly work and will watch your career trajectory with interest as the impact of your scholarly academic work continues to go. So congratulations once again, Professor Harriet Crawford. Colleagues and friends, I now request Professor Delenka Potters, the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, the Built Environment and Technology, to introduce Professor Harold Crawford to us. Thank you, Prof. Prof Foxcroft. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce our colleague, Professor Harold Crawford, this evening. I will take you through his CV in a little bit more detail. Harriet was born on 6 November 1977 and matriculated at Gill College in Somerset East in 1995. By 2002, he had been awarded BSc and MSc degrees in quantity surveying by the then University of Port Elizabeth. He proceeded to register for the PhD, also in construction economics, which was awarded in April 2007. He started his career in Ireland, where he worked as a quantity surveyor between 2004 and 2008, while completing his PhD. Thereafter, he joined the Nelson Mandela University as an associate professor in construction economics. In 2016, he was awarded his second master's degree. Also cum laude, as with his first master's degree, this time a master of business management and administration, from the University of Stellenbosch. Notably, he is currently busy with his third master's degree, a Master of Philosophy in Higher Education, also at Stellenbosch University. Professor Crawford is a seasoned lecturer at our university who is admired for his scholarly approach to this important work. He also played a significant role in the national and international accreditation of the quantity surveying programs offered by our university. He maintains membership and active participation in statutory professional and institutional councils, including the South African Council for Quantity Surveying Profession. Over the years, his efforts have been recognized through various scholarships and awards, including 
best overall contribution to the quantity surveying profession, best paper, best innovation paper, best transformation and sustainability paper, and best excellent paper, amongst others. His contributions in teaching and research were recognized as soon as two years after he joined the university, when he received awards for emerging teaching excellence and emerging research excellence in one year. In total, he has supervised five doctoral students, 15 master students and 115 honors treatise students to completion of their respective research projects and qualifications. He has authored or co-authored more than 70 papers published in accredited journals and conference proceedings during his academic career. At the same time, he continues to play a substantive role in our faculty in the portfolio of chairperson of the Faculty Postgraduate Studies Committee and previously chairperson of our Faculty Research Ethics Committee, to mention a few. These additional contributions are sincerely valued in our faculty. Prof. Crawford is commended by his students as follows. Prof. Crawford is an extraordinary supervisor, mentor and an expert in his field. I have long been impressed by his determination, which has made him an exemplary supervisor. Another comment reads as follows. Prof. Garrett is an exceptional academic who is contributing immensely to research within the built environment. I was fortunate enough to be supervised by him. Of course, we agree wholeheartedly with these commendations, which are but two of many. As you know, Gerrit, becoming a professor does not happen randomly. It is both a journey and a destination and requires tenacity, to say the least. Tonight, we celebrate your promotion to full professor in construction economics. We are both proud and privileged to have you as a colleague in our faculty, and we look forward to sharing this significant moment in your career with you. Can you kindly come forward to present your inaugural lecture? <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Foxcroft and Prof. Pottis for those kind words. Family, friends, and colleagues, welcome to my professorial inaugural lecture entitled Fostering Quantity Surveying Student Success, Unmasking the Factors that Influence Student Engagement. It is indeed an honor for me to be here tonight. I would like to take a minute to explain to you why I chose this topic while my nerves settle a little bit. Uh, um, that's why I have this slide. Um, as in my preparations, I didn't see many uh, um, learning and teaching topics in professorial inaugural lectures. So I chose this topic for two reasons. Uh, according to the inaugural lecture guidelines, a presenter should not focus on past academic contributors, contributions, but rather focus on a topic of their current work. Hence, I decided to talk to you about one, of, one element of my MPhil in higher education, which I'm doing at, at Stellenbosch at the moment. The last couple of years, I've been focusing more and more on learning and teaching. In my learning and teaching area, generally speaking, academics have a learning and teaching uh, research area and a discipline-specific area. My discipline-specific area is uh, business administration in the built environment, specifically looking at strategy and leadership. The other reason for picking this topic is, is that my friends, which are sitting here, and family generally ask me, continuously ask me, so apart from the two hours that you lecture a week, what else do you do? <laughs> so hopefully I can provide you with a little bit of insight of what else, do we, what, uh, what else academics are doing during the week. On a more serious note, before I start the topic, remember that the purpose of a learning and teaching research is to improve our learning and teaching practices. So it is therefore 
a very personal thing. Anyways, for me, it is very personal. While developing the presentation, I realized that some of the results could quickly escalate to a finger pointing exercise. And that is obviously not the idea here. The idea behind this topic for my MPhil came when I was lecturing my honor students and I felt that the engagement is not as good as it should be. Also note that we're only looking at the students' half of the story tonight. Uh, the other half of the story is the story of the, the lecturer's half of the story, and you can read about that once we, we, we publish my findings, hopefully. So as been indicated previously, the title of the lecture tonight is Fostering Quantity Surveying Student Success Unmasking Factors That Influence Student Engagement. I'm keeping the structure fairly simple. Uh, um, and in line with conference papers that I've presented before. So first of all, we can have an introduction where I tell you a bit about the background and common ground and the gap and the objectives. We're going to look at the literature, talking about the student engagement definition, the factors that influence student engagement and how student engagement factors fit into the student success network. We'll briefly talk about the methodology. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. I've been warned not to talk too much about the methodology for reasons. I'm sure the, there's a couple of scientists here that uh, I'll ask them to put the, put the um, AC up a little bit because it will probably be a little bit brutal for the scientists <laughs> around there to talk about social sciences. Then we're going to talk about the results and the conclusions. I'm not going to make any recommendations because it will be a bit premature to make recommendations before we have looked at the uh, at uh, the other half of the story. All right. So at the start of democracy in South Africa, the main failing of higher education sector was the absence of participation of previously disadvantaged students. The Department of Higher Education and Training indicates that the, particip the participation rates of previously disadvantaged st students have improved. However, although the issue of increasing access is being addressed. It is one thing to provide access to post-school education to as many people as possible. It is another to ensure that those who have access are also able to succeed. <coughs> Thus, student success and throughput rates remain a, remain a severe challenge to the university sector. The revolving door syndrome in which increasing access Increased access to higher education is not met by student success continues to ca characterize the higher education system in South Africa. Thus, the high failure rate encountered within the South African higher education requires urgent intervention. Since the costs associated with re-educating students and adding added pressure of readmitting failed students into a co continuing growing classes are substantial. The three most reliable predictors of student success are, are student engagement, academic preparation, and motivation. So for those of you who don't know what student engagement is, it's defined by two key elements. Firstly, what students do, and secondly, what institutions do. We'll take a little further look into the definition a little bit later on. An exclusive emphasis on academic preparation and motivation as success predictors means potentially employing more stringent admission or selection policies as a pathway towards improving student success, weakening the strategy of increasing access to higher education. Although we at the QS department rather prefer interventions rather than using more stringent admission and selection policies, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Therefore, using student engagement as a predictor of student success is critical. The roots of student engagement can be traced back to the educational research that emerged in, as, uh, as early as 1930. In the 1930s, Tyler focused on the importance of the amount of time spent on academic tasks. Pace then investigated the effect of quality of effort on the desired student outcomes underlying the importance of student agency. 
Austin's research on student involvement then confirmed that any form of student involvement, which include the amount of physical and psychological time and energy the student invests in educational process as positively associated with a wide variety of academic outcomes. Vincent Tinto's theory on academic and social integration was one of the first theories to emphasize that both the student and the institution had a role to play in keeping students from early and voluntary departure from higher education. In short, Tinto highlighted the role of positive academic and social experiences could play in creating a sense of belonging within, the, within institutions, while negative experiences in these areas might lead to a sense of disconnect or isolation for the student. Ku explained that student engagement extends beyond students' time and involvement in their studies. The primary premise of their work is that when students and staff take responsibility to devote time and effort to the tasks related to student-staff interaction, cooperation between students, active learning, prompt feedback, time on task, highly high expectations of students, and lastly, respect for diverse talents and ways of learning, then student learning and the success will improve. Who has also developed a framework for understanding student success, which we'll talk a little bit later on. Then eventually, Stradam and Kuh and Lutz uh, um, from the University, uh, and Lutz from the University of Free State amended that framework for the South African context. So previous research in the field of quantity surveying student success has been constrained to predicting student performance and throughput rates based on previous academic and, and course performance university entry scores, gender, age, and socioeconomic status and learning styles. So predicting quantity surveying, so uh, previous research in the quantity surveying department then is the, we, what we did is predicting of quantity surveying student performance and predicting of quantity surveying throughput rate, a cohort analysis. I'm gonna brag a little bit here, the two papers there uh, um, is the work from Sharon Dent's MSc Construction Economics, which I supervised, and those two papers won Best Paper Awards in 2015 and 2016, or 2019, at the SACQSB conference. Okay. The, others, the other LD, the learning and teaching uh, um, research that we did is experimental learning style, adaptive flexibility and academic performance of quantity surveying students by myself and Mylan Jonas, which unfortunately left us a couple of uh, um, weeks ago. Thus, you can see that no research has been done in the stu about student en engagement within the quantity surveying department. It's therefore essential that we start looking into student engagement. To establish uh, the objectives of this study, therefore, is to establish the factors that influence student engagement according to quantity surveying honor students, to establish the relationships between factors identified, and then to, devel to ve develop a systems influence diagram for factors that influence the student engagement according to the students. So let's look at the student engagement literature. In general, student engagement has received significant attention because it's consistently shown positive relations with academic performance, cognitive development, general abilities, psychosocial development, self-esteem, and student satisfaction. Despite the increased attention on student development or student engagement, there is still an absence of, a cons of consensus on the definition. In certain instances, it is, used to ref it, is, it is used to refer to little more than student attendance or task completion. However, deeper, broader, and more nuanced meanings which consider engagement to be a multidimensional, multidimensional is needed. Who comes the closest and with his definition of student engagement and appears to be the most widely accepted? So what did Ku say? Who indicates that student engagement can be defined in, two, uh, um, in terms of two components. The first is the amount of time and effort students spend on academic activities. 
and other activities that lead to experiences and outcomes that constitute student success. And then secondly, this, the second is how students allocate, how institutions allocate resources and organize leading opportunities, learning opportunities and services to induce students to participate in, in and benefit from such activities. So more succinctly put, firstly, it is what students do, and secondly, what institutions do. So student behaviors and student in institutional conditions are therefore critical, critical factors contributing to stu towards student engagement and will be unpacked in the following sections. So first, let's have a look at student behaviors. Student behaviors include level of academic challenge, active and collaborative learning, student staff interaction, and enriching educational experience, among other things. So the first one is the, le level, of academic the level of academic challenge. This behavior, force, this behavior focuses on whether the students find the activity, the academic work, intellectually challenging and creative. Since it is, this is the regarded as essential to student learning and quality. The level of academic challenge represents a range of activities from time spent studying to the nature of intellectual and academic tasks students are expected to perform. Active and collaborative learning, this behavior is based on the principle that students learn more when they are intensely involved in their education and are required to reflect on their learning. It focuses on the extent to which students are active in class, either through the supplementary learning opportunities inside and outside the classroom supplement academic programs. Although student behaviors in each cluster can stand alone, they are complementary and interdependent in that student experiences in these areas interact to promote higher levels of engagement. Let's have a look at the institutional conditions contributing to student engagement. 20 of the most engaging institutions in the United States of America, who also had higher than expected throughput rates, were analyzed by Kuhn. They identified the following six common institutional characteristics and conditions essential for student engagement. A living and lived educational philosophy. So a mission refers to the overarching purposes of the institution, what it is, what it stands for, as well as what it in, aspires to be. We've seen now that an institution apparently has five. I am on two, so I'm missing a couple there. So every institution typically has two missions, an exposed mission, it's a mission <coughs> statement, and an acted mission, what the institution actually does and whom it's to serve. The engaged institutions, in the engaged institutions, the gap between the two missions is smaller than those from most other institutions. The institution philosophy is composed of unspoken but deeply held values and beliefs about the, what is essential to the institution and its constituencies. Unshakable focus on student learning. The emphasis of, on holistic student learning runs broad and deep in policies and practices of engaged institutions. Student learning must become the rationale for the daily activities of everyone in, in the institution. Additionally, fac faculty administrators, staff and students are encouraged to be both the, the learner and the teacher. Four streams of practice characterize the learning environments of engaged institutions. Valuing undergraduate student learning, experimenting with engaging pedagogies, demonstrating a passion for talent development and making time for students. Creating, and creating learning environments that promote educational enrichment is the third one. Physical and, and psychological environments within an institution should support the learning and must reinforce its educational mission and values. Engaged institutions do not apologize for where, who, or what they are. They adapt their, they adapt their surrounding and campus environments in creative and educationally purposeful ways. 
In a deeply emotional way, the place of the engaged institution transcends the physical setting or location of the institution. Clarifying the, way, the pathways to maximize student success, engaged institutions use com a combination of required activities and social support to guide their students. They do two things very well. First, they teach students the institutional values what successful students do in, the, in their context and how to take advantage of institutional resources for their learning. Secondly, they make available what students need when they need it and have responsive systems in place in supporting teaching, learning and student success. Facilitating an improvement oriented institutional culture and ethos. Okay. Institutions that are effective in engaging and nurturing success are characterized by positive relentlessness. They channel limited resources toward mission-related initiatives to promote student success. Challenging budget situations are no excuse to suspend innovative efforts. They are symbolic of the firms studied by Collins that capsulated them from being only one of many good organizations to being great. Sixth one is the last one, making sure that everybody in this institution owns the quality of learning of students, of learning of student success. The importance of student success has to be endorsed by the university council, driven by and championed by top and middle management, facilitated by academic staff and complemented by support staff. Therefore, it is essential that an institutional network is formed to impact on the success of throughput rates. Although the common institutional characteristics and conditions above are discussed separately, these features are not independent and mutually exclusive. That is, elements of one of can be found in others. They are working together and shape the effectiveness of the whole. Now, let's look at how that student behaviors and institutional conditions fit into the student success framework. This figure presents the framework for understanding student success as, as a wide path in which students work. Say, for instance, that little circle there, let's say that circle is the, highest, the higher education context. As you can see, there are various international pressures like globalization, Competitive, competitiveness, rankings. I'm sure the DVC has had loads of questions this week about rankings and about our institution. Economic forces, social, political challenges having an impact on higher education. The same, in the same below, the national pressures where provincial and national policy accountability, poverty and inequality has an impact on the higher education context. So there are many twists and turns, develop, twists and turns, detours, roundabouts, and occasional dead ends in the path that a student needs to take from, from the pre-tertiary expenses to graduation. It is not simply a pipeline. Let's start with the beginning. The arrow on the left summarizes some of the many pre-university experiences students either enter experience that students enter higher education with, such as family background, academic preparation, attitudes to university readiness, family and peer support, and family mo and motivation to learn. So within the South African context, addressing low levels of language and numer numerical competence of learners, uh, um, Exiting the secondary school system is a critical challenge leading to proposals for flexible cur curricula and program structures, such as uh, um, four-year degrees and allow for innovative solutions. So some of the issues related to access to higher ed education includes affordability and, sustainable and sustained funding, entry requirements and challenges associated with transition into higher education. In South Africa, responses to these issues or challenges have been bursaries or loans, NISFAS, ISFAP, 
as well as other alternative programs. Also in South African context, alternative access routes as, such as bridging and foundation programs, extended degrees, as well as recognition of prior learning have helped broaden and mediate entry into the higher education. If, if learners are able to negotiate these transitions successfully, they enter the, the traditional higher education environment. And then we, start, then we start talking about the student engagement, what the university does and what the student does, which we've talked about previously. So the arrows at the top right corner represent, success, oops, represent successful students. Um, and the outcomes that the higher education aims to deliver, namely employable graduates, professional and postgraduate studies, graduate attributes such as leadership and citizenship. By focusing on student engagement and using the student engagement data, institutions can assess the prevalence of student, be the prevalence of student behaviors and institutional conditions related to success, and use the data to develop interventions that can be channeled to student energy to to channel student energy to activities that matter to their success. As said, I'm not going to talk too much about the methodology, but for your interest, we, in this particular study, we used interpretivism, an inductive approach, used interactive qualitative analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later, multi-method, cross-sectional cross time horizon. The participants with, were quantity surveying honor students, of the 2022 cohort, and we had a focus group with them, plus minus three hours, and then we had semi-structured interviews, each one of which is about 30 minutes long. Okay, so let's talk about interactive qualitative analysis. I suppose not many of you have heard about this. The, the rationale of using IQS methodology is that it is an innovative approach to qualitative research which seeks to minimize the power relations and biases traditionally associated with qualitative research. Participants are actively engaged in collecting and analyzing the data. The outcome of the IQ pro IQA process is a, is a systems influence diagram, which is a visual representation of a phenomena prepa prepared according to rigorous, reputable, reputable rules to achieve complexity, simplicity, comprehensiveness, and inter interpretability. <laughs> Struggling with those words. So, um, I don't want you to hop too much about this figure. It is, a, is the flow of the interactive qualitative analysis. There's two things that you have to remember here. First phase that we did was a, it's a focus group phase. In this, we collected in uh, um, inductive data collection phase which culminated in a systems influence diagram, and then the second phase comprised of individual interviews with focus group participants. This phase uh, um, verified and provide re provided richer narratives on the themes identified in the first phase. Okay, let's look at the results of objective one, which is to establish the factors that influence student engagement according to quantity surveying honor students. I'd like to give you a quick, quick glimpse into the focus group process, as I find it very interesting. Focus, the focus group was facilitated by Prof. Um, Ruth albert one of my mentors, and the process started as a silent brainstorm, brainstorming while considering the following question. What influences your academic engagement at Nelson Mandela University? Prof. albert used a guided guided imagery to help participants relax and clear their minds of, for the session. And then the participants had to think of as many answers as possible and then write them down on a card, each one concept per card, which would then tape to the wall. At the end of the day, we had 41 cards were produced and taped on the wall and Prof. Albertain then read out all the cards so that everybody could understand what each one of the cards means. So, there are all the cards. There's quite a few of them. Um, so, what we then asked the participants is 
to silently organize the cards into groups of meaning. And the grouping was then followed by the naming of the groups and providing a description and definition of each category. If you have a look there, there's a couple of them that I highlighted in red, are the ones that I, I found interesting. <coughs> there's a couple uh, busy, there's a couple that refers to being employed, method of teaching, social anxiety came out quite a bit from students, um, physical venue, uh, and many more. So, the focus groups then divided it into seven groups and each one of those, or seven themes, and each one of those themes were given a particular definition. First one was external realities, which was defined as external realities relative to the factors that students cannot control that have a bearing on their level of engagement. Then lecturer attributes. Lecturer attributes are the lecturer's attitude towards teaching and teaching and the students. Personal factors, personal factors relate to emotions of the student before and during the lecture. Physical environment, the environment that is conducive to learning. Student interaction, student interaction relates to the level of fact and factors that affect the willingness of a student to participate. Subject matter, subject matter relates to the nature of the context of the module and then teaching methods, the method in which the lecturer delivers the content. So, what we did next then, with these firms, with these themes and factors clearly defined, the group was asked to analyze the nature of the relationships between these themes and factors. They were given some rules on the possible relationships, um, on the relationships and when, and where they can asked to record their, and they were asked to record the responses on a relationships table like this. The table contained all the possible relationships. So as you, if you can see there at the top left, you see all the uh, um, different themes are highlighted. And then at the bottom, there's a table where you can record all, this, all the different kind of relationships. You can see one has a relationship to two. If you look at this, the second one there, one in this particular program, in this particular participant said that, uh, that one influences two. So we recorded all of those and we summarized it. And all of the, da all of the data in the previous, in those sections then were, were summarized and we entered it into a table like this to indicate the various relationships. I'm not going to go into the detail of the working of the table. It's simply there to record the various relationships in the various data value, delta values, which will ultimately be used to determine the drivers and the outcomes of these uh, um, themes. So we rejigged it a little bit in terms of, we, we reordered it into ascending order, and we found that the uh, driving for the drivers, the physical, or the, the primary drivers were physical environment and external realities, while the secondary drivers were lecturer attributes and subject matter. Pivot was teaching methods, and the secondary outcomes were personal factors, and primary outcomes, student interaction. Okay. So, what we did next is we developed the systems influence diagram. So, this is a cluttered Cluttered SID, and you can't, there's quite a bit of relationships there, and it's difficult to see what the, uh, what the different relationships are. So, we're going to have to eliminate some of the redundant relationships. For instance, what we did then, if you look at this, if you look at, uh, um, if you look at the physical environment, it influences personal factors. However, we can delete that one because there is a longer route. So all the short routes we deleted and we made sure that the longer routes stay there. So the physical environment influences personal factors. We deleted that one because physical environment influences lecturer attributes, influences teaching methods, influences personal factors. So there's a little train of influence which is there. So then we got to the uncluttered clicid. So you can see here that the physical environment, uh, the physical environment and external realities, which is the primary drivers, are at the beginning. Then we have the secondary drivers, which are lecturer attributes and subject matter. That influences teaching methods, which is the pivot. 
which influences personal factors, which influences student inter interaction. Now, let's have a look. It is important, now we finished with the, the focus group elements. Now it is important to have a look at the, what the interview said about these particular, especially the, the primary drivers and the secondary drivers and the pivot. <laughs> what did they say in detail about those three? Okay, so the individual interviews then. So we asked them in the individual, during the individual interviews, we asked the participants uh, um, about external realities and what did it mean and how did it influence student engagement. The individual interviews revealed that many of the students are working either part-time or full-time in the construction industry, which has a negative influence on the students' academic engagement. Some of the quotes that, that came to the fore, there are people who, do, who work that result in them being tired and not being able to interact in class. There are those that are in the that, that there are those that work in the morning, you'd be tired from work, and then it would be affect your enthusiasm to participate in class. You just wanted to get over with. The next one is the primary driver is physical environment. The influence, the individual interviewees revealed that the lack of ventilation, lighting, acoustics, venue size, venue shape, and equipment in the lecture halls harm the students' academic engagement. Obviously, if there's no ventilation, you get tired quickly. Why have <laughs> we have commercial law in one of the build building 45 rooms? I actually hate that venue. For me, it echoes, it's weird, so it kind of makes me drift away. Those smaller lecture rooms in North were cramped. There, were, there was a problem with the first year where QQH as well, where people had to find chairs in other venues. Lecture attributes, which is the secondary driver, uh, um, revealed that the negative lecture attributes, including being distant, cold, and stern, creates fear in students. If a lecturer is kind and empathetic, students will engage more. So we'll talk a little bit later about this, and this is one of the things that I learned, that this face is not very conducive to student engagement. <laughs> so, so I think a lecturer shows a certain level of distance or how, or how it comes across as a very, as very cold, stern person. It, it fills the student up with fear. And when a person is fearful, they will not engage. Or sometimes just the way the lecturer looks. <laughs> if the lecturer is enthusiastic and put an interest in the module, then you'll obviously want to engage a little bit more. Let's look at the subject matter. The interviews reveal that academic engagement in a subject largely depends on the interest and the, sub and, and the subject's complexity. If you're not good in math, then obviously you're going, to, you're going to engage less because you're struggling with it and you don't, uh, and, and that could cause you to be disinterested. I'm not interested with all that is being lectured. I think I will not want to engage in that lecture. I'd say if a module is a bit harder, the engagement goes down because not a lot of people understand what is being lectured. Teaching methods, the individual uh, um, interviews reveal that student academic engagement increases when the lecturers are innovative with the teaching methods. All the students indicated that there's no academic engagement with online lectures and that they prefer face-to-face -face lectures. I'd say the more innovative lecture, the more innovative the lecture is regarding teaching the subject matter no matter how difficult it is, the more provocative and creative the teaching methods, the more the students will engage. Although online has its pros, uh, uh, like being able to b go back and rewatch videos, I feel like the engagement is much less online. I feel like engagement is lower online, the lecture can't see you, so half the time people just join the class and leave, and we've seen that quite a bit. All right, so 
Having th thought about that in-depth and the in-depth information, now you can have a look again at the systems influence diagram. So it is important for us to, to have a look at those, those drivers, the primary drivers, the secondary drivers, and the pivot. In conclusion, uh, um, students are working full-time, uh, external realities conclusion, students are working full-time and part-time after COVID due to lectures being online. So although the industry is ex uh, experience is good, it is definitely affecting their engagement in class due to exhaustion. Physical environment, there are numerous elements in, the ele in lecture halls that, that are affecting students' engagement. However, there are some negative low-hanging fruits that we can solve very quickly. Lecturer attributes. <laughs> if you look like me, this is my happy face, this is my cry face. You know, if you look like me, then, then you have a problem and you have to communicate to your students that this is a face that I was born with. My son always asked me. My son continuously asked me, Daddy, why are you sad? I'm not sad, Paddy. It's, this is just my face. So it's important that you communicate with your students that this is, does not mean that I'm going to not engage with you. Then subject matter, students disengage when they are dealing with more complex modules. It's therefore essential to break those component, components into smaller, more manageable ones. And then lastly, the teaching methods. It's clear for that our, all our students are struggling to engage with the online lectures. All the students have called for lectures to come back onto campus. It's therefore essential to get our students back onto campus so that they can interact with staff members in a manner that suits them better. Thank you very much for listening to me and have a good evening. Good evening, uh, colleagues, and uh, good evening to the colleagues online. Uh, congratulations, Kharid, uh, uh, for the stimulating uh, lecture. Um, I'm not going to say much about uh, the student uh, perception <laughs> of an engaged lecturer or an engaging lecturer, but what I, could, I can say is that um, I'm incredibly grateful to be listening to your lecture because it just uh, resonates with the university in terms of a university in service of society and also a university that is um, striving to provide graduate attributes um, that will pre that prepares our graduates to go um, to the world and change the world and I think uh, there's a lot that we can learn from you as a university when we prepare our strategies uh, for, for graduate attributes in terms of engagement. So this is very revealing uh, for me. And uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this uh, contribution. And thank you very much for the manner in which you've delivered your lecture. And um, I think it's relevant to all of us. I could see Muki, the Dean of Education, agreeing all the time. So I had to <laughs> make sure that I, I, I listen. Thank you very much, uh, Herit. Um, I've said this before in other lectures that since I've started listening to these inaugural lectures, I feel very proud to be part of the university because all of them, from the chemistry of Prof. Zeni right up to, uh, we, we listened to the 
the one that was on sea turtles. And uh, I mean, now this and the variety of the lectures, this shows the diversity of what's happening across the university. And I think we've got an opportunity to pull this all together. And uh, your lecture also, uh, uh, Janine, was, was quite, was quite uh, stimulating. And the trend is continuing and you definitely uh, continuing with the standard, if not setting the bar even higher. I think in terms of relevance also um, of, uh, of the work uh, to us as society, but specifically to, to our university. And I must also congratulate you on your outstanding and all-round contribution at the university, not that as an academic only, but also as a teacher and as a researcher. And also I must commend you for the bravery in participating in the research ethics committees and, uh, and also at the postgraduate uh, scholarship uh, committees both institutionally and uh, and the faculties and I've had the pleasure of interacting with you at postgraduate committees and your very valuable uh, contribution and thank you for that. Um, I have the couple of uh, messages uh, that I would like to pass in terms of uh, congratulations. There's a um, a message from the president of the Alumni Association um, contributing or congratulating you on the lecture, but also inviting you to become part of the uh, Alumni Association of, uh, of the university and uh, contributing uh, in the activities of the Alumni Association. But also the family, your family, you've asked us to thank your family. They've been mentioned, uh, your wife, I don't know where she's sitting now. Uh, yes, <laughs> Katerina, thank you very much. And your, your son in absentia and uh, your parents and, and all other family members uh, that you, you have uh, highlighted. You've also asked us to thank uh, Professor Raymond, Raymond Gando. Yes, Raymond, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And Professor John Smallwood uh, in person. And, uh, I think they very much easily engage with you, but we certainly are as your colleagues at the university. Uh, they see um, the, the kindness and the humanizing face. <laughs> I don't think it's, uh, yes. And uh, there are other line managers um, that Harit has asked us to thank. Professor Fanny Baez, is it Baez? Yes, Mr. Roy Cumberledge, current HOD, Professor Dalienka. Portis, um, Dr. Sue Petrotos, um, and um, Professor Ben Van Veek, and uh, Ben left us the previous executive dean, and Gerrit uh, is very grateful. Current students, honors, masters, and doctoral students, and if I have missed anyone that you would have liked us to thank, I apologize, but um, you, I'm sure you know that Gerrit is very grateful. And uh, I would like also to thank you as uh, colleagues uh, for making this time to come and attend and listen to this lecture. And also for those online who are joining us online, uh, thank you very much for joining and we appreciate your support, the friends of the university, the research associates and people generally who are interested in the university and particularly uh, in this work. We really thank you and ask you to continue joining us as we journey along as a university in providing an enabling environment for our students and also for us to learn from our students because there are a lot of learnings that we also get uh, from the students as we uh, co-create solutions. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. I mean, I could say a lot more, but uh, I would like you to enjoy the the refreshments outside, and uh, for that, thank you very much for being here. Um, I don't know if there's any token of association, or, I mean, of appreciation from the Alumni Association. Lindy, yes, okay. <laughs> yes, so the Alumni Association would like to present you with this token of appreciation, and uh, because I don't want to leave the mic. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, you. You very much. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harit. Thank you. Uh, please enjoy the refreshments outside.